Is this we just shout out some of our favorite players from 15 years ago. Like, big shout out to Kelsey Griffin. You're just remembering some Huskers. Absolutely. <laughs> the WNBA draft is almost here. On this week's Saturday edition of Ultimates Basketball, we'll dive into our final 2024 WNBA draft board, which is available in the description or the show notes below. Let's get into it. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Welcome. You are locked on women's basketball. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. My name is Andrew Cruz. I'm your Saturday host covering the WBA draft and prospect scouting. I am joined by my co hosts, M. Adler and Lincoln Schaefer. M covers the WNBA with a focus on player development and the game within the game. Lincoln also con- contributes to our WNBA draft coverage at the next. So, to get our, to get our conversation started, I want to present some questions to y'all uh, for our newer listeners as well as our returning listeners. So, simple questions, but how does this draft compare to previous drafts in terms of both the top end talent and depth? You can start, M. Oh, uh, well, in comparison to, uh, in comparison directly to last year's draft, uh, those of you who read our recently published article can see that this class is much stronger at the top, but it's actually not much deeper than last year. You know, we have over, we have almost three times as many players who we have, who we have evaluated that they're, that they're sort of most likely outcomes are at least being a solid bench player for, you know, most of their career. But we have only a couple more players evaluated as like, genuine legitimate possible contributors um you know i think it doesn't take it's not that hard to look at this class and see you know from the top down you know where last year you had Aaliyah boston and then a couple interesting prospects behind her in jordan horston and diamond miller grace berger etc in this class you know you go through a few more names before you get to you know your grace berger of sorts you go through kim and brink Aaliyah edwards lily Lake khan a little down the farther down the board, you know, Carla Liete is sort of in that same tier as Grace Berger, but that's still end of first round for us in comparison to last year where Grace Berger was like a top six pick, at least in our book. Um, you know, I think going through that sort of lens of things, this class is a welcome change from recent classes where sort of the concept of like a mid first round talent just hasn't really existed. Yeah, we have a lot more like obviously you're going to get the more interesting players at the top. I think that we'd all agree that Cameron Brink and Aaliyah Boston are kind of the same level of prospect. Um, And to have Mm. someone who is very clearly ahead of both of them is, is big. And you know, the deferrals hurt the depth of the class, but that's, that's always going to happen when you have COVID year players, but it's still, it's still a, a pretty strong draft and, Notably stronger than the few drafts before the last draft. Yeah, then for our second question here to start this off, what was the most difficult evaluation for you guys in this class? Hmm. Lincoln, you want to take that? I think that the hardest player to evaluate was Alyssa Peely, who is (laughs) very obviously an incredible offensive player who is undersized at her college position, which means massively undersized at a pro position. (laughs) Um, And I don't think that she can do the Alicia Clark 5'11 college post player thing and just learn how to play on the wing. Um, And I don't think that she's the same level of defender that AC is or ever was. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's not that she's difficult to evaluate but it's difficult to think about what will translate with PLE and how valuable those skills are in comparison to her uh, obvious weaknesses. She's a weird player because she has obvious strengths and obvious weaknesses, but I don't know what they mean when you put it all together in one package. Yeah, I think outside of PLE, we talked a bit earlier in the year about how 
some of these players were hotter evals for us, whether that was Rakia Jackson, Angel Reese. No, I think there were players in this class who were more difficult to evaluate just in terms of these are a lot of weird skills they have. But when you put everything on paper, I think most players in this class are actual were actually kind of easier than, than it felt in the moment. With Rakia Jackson, with Angel Reese, I mean, I think those are the most obvious and easy examples. You have players who watch them enough and it's not that hard to see what they do well, not that hard to see what they do poorly, you know, as long as you got them against the right competition. Um, and from there, it's just, I think the difficulty is figuring out what that really means. And that's so context dependent, right? You know, if we're talking about Angel Reese, it's, you know, do we think she can ever be able to finish? Or how do we think that translates to the positionality at the next level? These are projection questions that I think we're getting more comfortable with. And that I think, you know, our answers differing from those of WNBA talent evaluators, like Angel is going to go well above where we have her in our rankings. But if, Sort of bridging that gap, I think, for us sort of answers those questions in a way that it's it's not a terribly hard evaluation, but it is a weird one, I guess is how I'd put it. I think for me, other than Peely, maybe the one who gave me trouble was probably Cardoso, just in terms of figuring out what, like, it. we know what she's good at. There are a couple things on both ends that make it very confusing to try to you know, say whether these are just limiting factors or whether these are actually like poison pills for her. We can get more into that later. But trying to, I think, balance those is a little trickier than some of the more straightforward prospects in this class. Yeah, one yeah, thing on... The, one thing I was going to note we, on... <laughs> one thing I was going to note on one the of Peely, you, One of you. One thing I was going to note on the Peely front is even whenever we went back to like December, whenever we were first looking at her as like a 2024 draft prospect was... Even evaluators themselves were like, I don't know what to do yeah. here. And that provides so much reassurance for us just because if they don't know what, what to do, like, what, what are we looking at with Peely's skill set? There's probably going to be some teams that have a first-round grade on her, and there's others that are probably going to be like, I don't know if I would draft her. Like, I don't, know, I don't know what to do with this. I don't feel comfortable with this. And there might be some who completely forget to put the, her on their draft board uh, yeah. before they get to the late second round and then go, crap, I forgot to include <laughs> I forgot to include her in this little D20 game we're playing. Then yeah, one more... I think that we got to a point where <laughs> it's not it's not about questioning what we think these players do well and like what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are, but it became more philosophical about the arguments that we had were philosophical about what traits we value in these players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one more question before we get to our first break. Who is your prospect? Who is like, this is the one I'm like, I'm putting all my card into. This is the player I'm higher on the, than consensus. Who would that be for you guys? It's funny. I know for you, you're... The, so for, for listeners, the way we do this is we all, you know, we're scouting throughout mm -hmm. the year. We're all keeping notes. We all have our evals. And then what we do is we come together one night, we get drunk, and we talk to each other about sort of finding the median between all of our individual grades to determine the overall board. So Hunter, I know for you, your personal order is the exact same order that we ended up going with. And I think for Lincoln and myself, we have only a couple people that we're a little bit off on. So this is, this is I think, one of the chalkiest years um, that we could have gotten in that sense. I think for me, I don't know if I'm actually higher on anyone than what we've put down. I think... I, I would I'll, say, I'll I would say, yeah, I mean, uh, that's my beat. It's been my beat yeah. for like three years. She's not going to get a chance in this league because this league hates shooters who can't, who can't hit a very inefficient level of like, like pull up middies. My pick is um, pretty easily uh, Nadia Poch, who is, I'm betting on the athleticism, on the defensive tools. Um, and, you know, that could burn me, but I will be far from the first talent evaluator to be fooled by a 19-year-old um, who is an incredible athlete with great defensive instincts that can't play offense very well. The the Hunter Cruz MVP of the draft. This was the this was the player that I was in on the most this year. Leilani Correa out of Florida. This has been the player I've been talking about for months now, and I think this is she. And like you said, they like players that make inefficient uh, or miss a lot of pull up twos. She can do that. <laughs> If that's what you need. <laughs> but she can't. She can't make threes. Make yeah, threes that's the problem. Goals. She can make threes. They don't like that. 
Yeah. She can make a lot of threes. But then she balances it out, though. So it's you're getting a little <laughs> bit of both. And, yeah, so after the break, we'll get into our board itself. How, how, how do we order these players? Why do we order these players? And more. You know that instant confidence boost you get from an outfit that makes you look really good? That's what you get with Stitch Fix. With Stitch Fix, you get a stylist who understands your style, size, and budget. They do all the shopping for you. It's the easiest way to update your wardrobe this season. Easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist that helps you find new, on-trend favorites that will work for you. Stitch Fix makes it so easy. I don't like to shop, and they say they save me that time and effort. Plus, I get outfits that make me look good and feel really good. And if you don't love something, you just send it back. Shipping, returns, and exchanges are always free. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. You get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on. Stitchfix.com slash locked on. Passion drives patience. The formula for winning championships is, is also what keeps your ride or die alive. Eva Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance, superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED lights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for, and with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because eBay Motors, with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make eBay Motors your choice. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers if you didn't know already locked on sports today brings you can't miss analysis opinions and news streaming 24 7 on youtube or the free amazon fire tv channels app. part of the locked on podcast network your team every day to get back into this let's open up with our lottery how do we have these players graded how are they ordered so, for him, just explain our process behind ranking these players, and it was it was a pretty consensus. Yeah, we rank them in order of how much we like their schools. No, not for me. Notably, I strongly am not uh, in favor of the Iowa Hawkeyes. <laughs> for um. for podcast readers at home uh, who are using the the audio medium. Lincoln is currently wearing a giant Nebraska t-shirt. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> the way that we actually do this is we, uh, you know, we do our evaluations. We take our grades. We do our consensuses. We, you know, you can read more about this on the board. You can read more about this in the piece linked in there in the intro, in which I have broken down exactly what the scouting grade means, why we use them, um, and what that means for specific translations to the WNBA and, you know, probabilistic range of outcomes but you know in, in layman's terms we, we get together we say hey what do you think of this player and then we write it up we bridge the gap be uh, between our different evaluations and then we say okay what does this mean for their WNBA future and what number corresponds to that and then we put them in order of their numbers turns out Caitlin Clark probably going to be pretty good at basketball she's very good we've talked about her a lot Good basketball player. Can't talk about her enough. That is true. At two? <laughs> Who, do two? Who do we have at uh, two? Who do we have at two? At two, we have Cameron Brink, a big from Stanford. She's also good at basketball, um, and especially good at playing defense. Some people may think she's not too, as good as she actually is at playing basketball. Those people are wrong. You know, she can struggle to shoot and score and sometimes has foul issues, but, like, look at her body of work. She made 73 consecutive free throws. <laughs> she led the NCAA in blocks two years in a row while playing, like, 24 minutes per game. She's just a, a transcendent defensive prospect. Yeah, and just watch her passing and her movement through space long enough, and you're like, oh, yeah, this player's going to be, like, a killer pick-and-roll option. Yeah. I've, oh, my goodness. I'm just thinking about short rolls now. If I'm, you get her in a I'm, place I'm, where she can have a guard that actually draws two to the ball, that's going to feed families. 
I'm so glad Tara's crimes against offensive basketball are finally come to an end. And the thing I want to note about with Brink is what's often a problem with scouting on the public side is recency bias. This notion to look at a player's tournament run and then evaluate them based on that alone. There's a reason we do our post-draft rankings. We started that last year is to really build these evaluations year by year to track players' development and kind of where they're trending. And with someone like Brink, she's been trending upwards. Like she's been, she's gotten better at different areas of her game every year. And Cardoso has also gotten better for sure, but I don't think Cardoso has gotten better to where Brink was already at. Like, I don't think we're projecting Cardoso to be that level of a prospect. Yeah. I mean, you know, Cameron Brink can finish at the rim, which is sort of a thing that we're not really sure can be taught. And uh, like Cardoso can't. Cardoso also definitely cannot shoot. She definitely cannot really, like, manage space in a pick and roll. She's not a particularly advanced passer. She is taller than Cameron Brink. She doesn't have a much longer wingspan. They have about the same wingspan. She's taller. She's stronger. She's not a better post-up option. So that kind of goes out the window. She's a better straight-up post-up defender. But that's sort of the only thing she's better at. Now that I start saying this out loud, that is sort of the only thing she's better at. And that's why Brink is ranked several spots higher on our board than Cardoso. <laughs> it's a six to think way to put it. We also have an international prospect at number three. Yes. Lily Khan. We also have we also have three international prospects in our first round. Uh, we've talked about it in a Not a first episode. round, to be clear, because this is not a mock draft. In our first round grades portion. But yeah, this isn't a mock draft. There's going to be a. We would like to be clear. This is not a mock draft. No one is ever taking a French person in the in, in the in the lottery for many reasons. It's possible. Yeah, yeah it's still French. Yeah, it's still French. Yeah, that's true. That's a that's a that's a sort of you know you know you can be be as good as basketball if you as you want. You're still French. Yeah, Absolutely. So to round out our top five at number four we have Aaliyah Edwards, and at five we have we have JC Sheldon at five. Right, yeah, JC Sheldon at five. <laughs> we, do six, 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 five. <laughs> we do have JC Sheldon at five. We do have JC Sheldon at five. Cardoso at six. Zuki at seven. Carl Leite at eight. Nadia Poch at nine. And Angel Reese at ten. Who would you say is the biggest riser of this group throughout the entire season? Between I'm, like the I mean, like by definition, range. it has to be Camilla, right? It could, be, it could be Angel. I was always high on Camilla. I'd just like that to be noted. Define you were higher. higher. I, you were I, higher. I was higher than you two. I think that that's fair. I had a literally 30, had her as a six, seven. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. You can't teach being six seven, and you know she's the shown U.S. government that she is, trying, be, is trying to disprove that. <laughs> <laughs> she's shown that she can like be a a very good college basketball player. Um, she gets up and down the floor. She's a very good like straight line athlete. I have some questions about the lateral movement. I have some questions about, you know, we all have questions about the half-court finishing. But she does things that you need basketball players to do and is very tall. It's a ringing endorsement. I mean, it's worked to keep some other people in the league. Yeah, for sure. No, she's not. I mean, she's good. We have a good grade on her. I think I actually had her higher than you guys did. I had her a half-grade higher when it came time to. Yeah, you did, I think. I did, yeah. So history, history will ven- will uh, will venerate me specifically, but yeah, I mean, Angel was also, uh, I think, a notable riser for us, um, mostly because of attrition. I'm gonna be completely honest. Like she passed a couple people on our board, but I think for the most part, it's just it's the same skill set it was. But I think we're just more confident in the passing and in the screening in particular. The movement's still there. The feel's still there. The processing is. No, it's really good. It's there. We've got really good reports on the motor and on the and on the work ethic that we already knew was there. So, you know, I think it just solidifies the faith that we have in her as opposed to, you know, some players ranked below her, which, you know, we're sort of still hoping a little bit more than we are actually, you know, dead set on. Yeah, to close out this episode, we can talk about Nika Mule and also some other prospects towards the end of our board. 
It's almost playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks. All on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Okay, for this third segment, we didn't talk at length about Nico Mule in our own episode. Uh, you can thank you can thank George Amor for that. We were gonna hold we we're gonna do an entire point guard episode there, but George Amor Nico and Mule, Sarah Andrews. Yeah, we we're gonna do both of them. Yeah, but with Nico Mule, we've heard that she helped her stock tremendously with this tournament run. What is what is it with with uh, Nico Mule that excites you as a prospect, and what are the concerns that keeps her from being? In the top twelve, she plays good defense. She passes the ball, um, and you know what's really concerning is um, everything else. She doesn't, she doesn't score very much. <laughs> that that is kind of a problem. She's always been a reluctant shooter. She's up to the shooting volume from extremely reluctant to moderately reluctant. But you really want to get that out of the reluctant shooter zone. <laughs> She's shown that she can make those threes. It's it's just taking them. Please, Nika, shoot the ball more, please. That's, I, I'm begging you. Sometimes we see her drive and finish, and it's like, ooh, she just drove and finished, and then she like doesn't do it for like three games in a row. Super annoying. Yeah, it's like she's she's fun. She plays great defense. Yeah. She's shown that she can play great defense, and, and you know they lost to Iowa, but she played very good defense. And, you know, I didn't need anyone to tell me that Nika was going to rise in the draft uh, based off of that performance. She wears a UConn jersey, and she played really well against the best player in the country. That is literally always going to get you to rise in the WNBA draft because a lot of decision makers, um, let's just say they don't necessarily put in as much time as I think they should. Yeah, like, Nika did not do anything in that game that we didn't already know that she could do and probably would do in that game. I think, if anything, the fact that she looked that good, and no offense to her, again, we both think she's an elite defender, mostly. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a full indictment of Lisa Bluter's game plan and her adjustment, like, for two and a half quarters, maybe even three quarters. The fact that Nika belongs to this weird... This weird and very small subset of players. You have her, you have Raven Johnson, you have Bree Hall. There might be someone else I'm forgetting, but it's a very weird grouping where you have elite isolation guard defenders provide great, provide a you know great ball pressure, excellent, um, excellent ball denial, all this kind of stuff. Who for some reason like just kind of just aren't very good at getting over ball screens. It's like if they could get over ball screens, we're talking about like an elite guard defender period. And instead it's like they're elite at almost everything except like the most common play in basketball, which is very strange. And yet Iowa just didn't run her through a lot of ball screens, which is incredibly strange. They did. They, they, I don't really know how to explain that game plan. Uh, they eventually stopped doing that, which was good. Um, but yeah, like if Nika, if, if I didn't have any concerns about Nika Mule and, you know, navigating pick and roll screens, so much worse than like everything else she does against guards, then like I would be probably half a grade higher, if not more. It is she's perplexing. Not in like a hard to evaluate way, but just in terms of like a why is she kind of a way. And also a why don't you do this all the time kind of way. Yeah. 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 So to recap the board, we have at one, Caitlin Clark. Two, Cameron Brink. At three, Lele Khan. At four, Aaliyah Edwards. At five, J.C. Sheldon. At six, Camila Cardoso. At seven, Rakia Jackson. At eight, Carla Leite. At nine, Nadia Poch. At ten, Alyssa Peely. At eleven, Angel Reese. At twelve, Charisma Osborne. At thirteen, Nico Mule. At fourteen, Leilani Correa. At fifteen, Hannah Jump. At sixteen, Celeste Taylor. At 17, Elizabeth Kitley. And then we have a draft and stash, third round grade on Isabel Borlace. We have, like, how many words was it final? Like 8,000? A little shy of 8,000. 
Yeah. Also, if you feel like yelling at us in the comments right now, I the only thing I ask is that you at least look at the article first. And spell their names and correctly? Then, yeah, and spell the names right. Look at the article, spell the names right, and then you can yell at us in the comments as much as you want. Um, we know you want to. And, and, and you know what? That's fair. We're yelling at each other all the time for these takes. Absolutely. And then, appre- and then appreciate our Alyssa Peely. If you can't, uh, Alyssa Peely comps, <laughs> if you can't appreciate anything else on our board, at least appreciate that section right there. That was our best work. If you laugh and we make you think, then I think that we've done our job. Yeah. It's almost 8,000 words, and the only ones that matter are that, like, 20 we spent on comps. That took the, that took the most time. It, I'd, I'd like to it honestly did take the most time. <laughs> Personal shout outs to Sean Foreman and Aaron Barzilai, the founders of Stathead and uh, Her Hoop Stats. Without those two men and the work that they've done, this would literally be impossible. For you. Mic job. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for my awesome basketball, your first listen every day. Join the team back next week for continued coverage of women's college basketball. The draft is coming up on Monday. Um, there's going to be, it's going to be chalk, right? And there's going to be nothing unexpected that's going to happen. Just as you kind of expect it on a mock draft. The WNBA draft famously does exactly as everyone predicted. They do. If you missed yesterday's episode in terms, or two days ago's episode in terms of whether or not it will be chalk, please check out Jackie Powell's interview with Sabrina Merchant on the Lockdown Women's Basketball podcast feed. Discussing who could go in the lottery. Yes, I broke out my uh, I broke out my, uh, my my voiceover ad announcer voice for that one. The podcast voice. Podcast business. What's the business? All right, guys. Have a great rest of your weekend.